Well, hello there, everybody, and uh, welcome aboard. Uh, checking my timepiece, as we used to call them back when I was born in the 1700s. Uh, we are right on time. So uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, I don't know. I never get tired of talking about today's uh, subject matter. Um, and and the rules for me are just really simple. I mean, they're, they're, we, we lay them out. They're codified. We call them codified, which means that we put them all out there. At, at some point, I was the chair of the rules committee. I, I don't know what happened to me. Uh, I know that uh, in the past, I was the uh, was one of the judges in the appellate level. So if somebody uh, wanted to appeal a case, then then uh, it would be something that I would be dealing with. That was in the old Sandicor MLS. So I think I've been teaching the MLS longer than most people have been alive. But uh, we'll talk about that a little bit today. We're, we're going to have some fun with it because I can actually make rules kind of fun. So, so we are at the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors. And my name is Kevin Burke. And there's my telephone number. And, and there's my email address. I am happy to hear from you. Please let me know anything that I can do to help. And I probably need to close that. Uh, and uh, so I have some credentials, I guess, that make me qualified to speak about the subject matter. Um, I took took off chair of the rules committee, I don't know, probably a year or two ago, and I just we never had a meeting. Nobody ever talked to me about it. So, um, But you can see that I'm very much into risk management. So on the right-hand side, very much into risk management. On the left-hand side, a lot of legal stuff. Um, but that takes us into our next step, which is we're going to be talking about stuff that might appear to be legal. Folks, I am not a practicing attorney. I have absolutely no interest uh, whatsoever in uh, in the practice of law. I think they work way harder than we do. Um, and uh, good. OK, so I think they work way harder than we do. And, and uh, whoops, I thought I'd turn my ringer off. I want to make sure that doesn't go off. So uh, I'm not a practicing attorney. So that's the gist of it. OK, that being said, my trial work and I do a lot of trial work is limited to testifying as an expert witness. Again, standard of care, agent's duty of inspection and disclosure and market conditions in San Diego County. Those are my specialties. And certainly the the uh, law of agency, as it were, is something that I get called on all the time. So uh, um, conversation day not intended to be a substitute for the advice of your broker, nor for that of your attorney please consult with them as appropriate. Um, and, if, and if they have something that's going on, they need to talk to me, please have them give me a call. I don't have any problems with it at all. I'm happy to help in any way that I can. I come from that position. And by the way, so does our MLS. Our MLS comes from the position of education. You know, we want to help people, we want to educate people. You know, we don't, uh, we're not here. It's not a, a intended to be a punishment. Um, but we'll talk about what punishment looks like. Um, so that being said, our webinars are intended to be interactive. Please utilize the Q&A button, please. I'd love to be able to go hot mic on everybody because that's always, for me, that's always a lot of fun. I get uh, a lot of interesting things that happen in there. Uh, and uh, But uh, again, the Q&A button is the way we're going to have to do it. The Zoom program has some uh, issues with it, uh, you know, unmuting people at the worst possible time. And, and so uh, we don't want that to happen. So anyway, the Q&A button is really good. Ask questions, offer input. I do look forward to hearing from you. We're going to be talking about subject matter that is day to day. For me, for sure, day to day. I'm in our MLS every day. Um, it's just there's so much going on um, and so many good things. And, and I was just helping an agent uh, input a listing uh, just, uh, uh, just right before this class. I literally had to get off that call to, to do this uh, webinar. But inputting a listing, um, I showed him some uh, ways like tax autofill and a couple of other things that just made his job a whole lot easier. And, and so again, you know, I want to help, you know, if there's something I can do for you, please let me know. And please ask questions today, because if you don't ask the questions, then, you know, the advantage of having me do these live is that you can ask me questions versus you look at the webinar taped and, and that's going to be, uh, you know, you can't ask a tape question. So, um, so this morning we did creating the ultimate listing agreement. I'm going to tell you, we killed it. We really did. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I will load that video up this evening onto the YouTube website, which I will give you the address for a little bit later. Um, but I put all of my videos up onto the YouTube website. They're free. Um, they're, they're all good. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and again, they're intended to educate. And I've had, I, I had, a, uh, I had a, a, a gentleman call me on the phone. I assume they were a gentleman, called me on the phone and, and, and said, 
you know, I just watched your video on how to read a preliminary title report. And I go, really? And, and he said, God, it's the best thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anything uh, that was so good. And I said, well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I really do. Everybody likes a compliment, but, but who are you exactly? And he said, oh, I'm a buyer. And I went, uh-oh. I said, well, I really don't want to get in front of your agent, whoever is helping you with the transaction. And his comment was that the title officer wouldn't call him back. The agent wouldn't call him back. Uh, and I said, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what to tell you, but he said, I learned everything I needed to learn by looking at your video. So, uh, so I don't know, you have other things to do with two hours of your day, but, uh, I assure you most of my videos, I'm not looking for filler. Most of my videos, uh, recently they've been two hours. Um, we've run out of room. So, uh, today eh, probably it's a possibility we'll run out of room today too, because I'm going to talk to you today, not only about the rules, but also about the most frequently violated rules. Um, so we'll talk about that. I'm going to show you where everything is. I want you to have access to it. Excuse me. Okay. On a Tuesday morning, we will be talking about CRS tax and finding pre-foreclosure properties. Uh, and then on Tuesday afternoon, we'll talk about fast stats uh, and understanding your housing market. So I, I call this, you know, MLS week because we're going to be talking about a lot of MLS stuff. Um, but uh, I think pre-foreclosure property is one of the most fun things that we do. Um, and I set you up so that you can you know, go looking for stuff that nobody else is farming to. Nobody else is marketing to these. Um, and then Fast Stats, probably one of the best programs we have out there that, that gives you an opportunity to pull up your zip code or your area, whatever, and actually get a, get a, a thumbprint of the market at that time. And I think personally, you should be printing those and taking them with you. You know, not print 100, print five, um, print them in color, you know, put your logo on it. I'm going to show you how to put your logo on it uh, and then take those with you and, and, and literally show people, you know, uh, you know, what they're what's going on in their market. I think you should sit down at the coffee shop and, and uh, you know, become the, the king of your court, so to speak, or the mayor of your town. I'm considered the mayor of Del Mar. And so people come in all the time. Mr. Mayor, I have a question for you. And so, you know, literally. Really, I always have answers for them that, uh, you know, and, and not, I don't have to know all the answers, right? I just have to, I just have to, I don't have to know everything in the library. I just have to know how to find it. So that's how my, my philosophy works. Okay. So, so today member benefits, um, thank you for joining us. We're going to talk about MLS rules. And I took out the part that said MLS rules and tools, and I just left it as MLS rules because that's kind of our subject matter. So and I believe, I believe wholeheartedly because knowing is better than guessing. I think that, that, uh, you know, our rules are very different than, for example, the, the driver's manual. Um, so, you know, the DMV puts out a, a driver's manual that says, here's the rules for, you know, driving on the road. I have yet to meet anybody who has read it. Um, it's not a money-making opportunity for people. It's a money-making opportunity for the state, of course, if you violate a rule. But, you know, I had friends uh, with the uh, San Diego County motor officers. Uh, I remember I was uh, chatting with a buddy of mine, a, a motor officer. We were sitting out in front of the Del Mar Post Office, and there's a double yellow line running down the middle of the road. And I can't tell you how many people crossed that line to go back and pull up the other way to to park their car because there was an open spot but you know every single one of them he said come over here and and because why because that double yellow line you may not do a u-turn around the double yellow line so but when they broke that 90 degree plane to go up into the parking spot they definitely you know were no longer now they violated a rule and so he explained it to them as they came up to him of course <laughs> i wouldn't turn them down um and uh, super guy um and uh but probably in, in, in a half an hour, 45 minute conversation that we were having, you know, he probably grabbed about 15, 20 people and had them come over and he gave them a little lecture on what that that meant. But you would never know that. Right. I mean, some people know it, but who's going to read the manual? So I, I think our MLS is a lot less complicated than that. I think there's a handful of things. Most of it, I think we can do off of instinct. Um, but 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 let's talk about that. OK, so. Uh, Education equals data integrity. It's really, really, really important. So, you know, where do I find the MLS rules? I'm actually going to show you right now how to do that. So essentially, there's two ways. All right. And so the one way is to go to sdmls.com. Um, and again, as I said earlier, I'm in these websites all the time. So so let's go to uh, MLS. Uh, uh, 
sdmls.com. So I am looking right now at sdmls.com. Now, this is because the, the SDAR and the SDMLS are two separate corporations. So they're two separate entities that are operating uh, in San Diego County. And so when I go to SDMLS, I'm feeling like I'm going to find more current information. I'm going to show you where the information is. I'm going to show you what the information is. And then I'm also going to take you over to the other site and show you where it is there as well. So for right now, I'm in the MLS, uh, obviously dedicated to your success. Of course it is. I'm gonna go over here to compliance. I'm going to click on compliance and now I'm gonna get compliance rules and regulations, okay? And so then underneath that, I've got a whole bunch of stuff. I got rules and regulations. I got listing exclusion, clear cooperation policy coming soon. And each of these I can click on and, and get resources for those things, okay? So, so, uh, so let's take a look at some of those things. So first of all, I'm going to pull up the, uh, where did it go? Here we go. Um, so I'm gonna pull up. I, I, I pulled all this stuff up. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of stuff to talk to you about. So let's let's take a look at some of these things. So the first thing I pulled up was what? This is the uh, listing. I've got to remember what it is. So so this is kind of the purpose behind our, our listing, you know, why we do what we do. But there's also some fields in here that we, that we cater to. So for example, um, there is a difference between a canceled and a withdrawn listing. And when I was teaching new member orientation, I always made a big deal out of this. So withdrawn listing, means I have a listing in the MLS. We've decided to take it off of the market, um, and uh, but I still have a listing agreement. So taking it out of the MLS um, is, uh, and, and issuing it as a withdrawn listing, uh, remember that withdraw you may not solicit a withdrawn listing because a withdrawn listing says I still have a listing agreement. That's very different than a canceled listing. A canceled listing says, I no longer have a contract with the seller. So I can go ahead, other people can go ahead and solicit that listing. So there's a difference between the two and, and there are violations associated with, with uh, soliciting withdrawn listing because again, they still have a contract with the seller, okay? So that's one of the biggest things that we need to be thinking about uh, as far as a rule is concerned. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you the easy way to find all the solutions to these things. So, so withdrawn, canceled, those are two uh, pivotal points in, in your business. An expired listing means that the listing has, uh, time has run out um, because when you input the listing, you also input the time that it's going to not no longer be listed. So you put the starting and the ending date of your listing into the MLS. And please folks, make sure it coincides with what your listing agreement says. If your listing agreement says it expires on, on, uh, on, uh, uh, let's say, what is this, this September, let's say listing, your, your listing agreement with the seller says it expires on the 30th of September, but in the MLS, you wanted to give yourself some more time. So you put in October the 15th, that's going to very clearly be a violation. Okay. And so, you know, if, if the MLS calls you up and says, send us a copy of that listing agreement, you got a really short period of time in which you need to be doing that. And it better, the numbers better line up. Okay. So, um, so that, that, that's kind of one of the big general rules is don't be putting anything into the MLS that isn't also in your listing agreement, okay? So my listing expired says that I no longer have a, a listing with a seller. Now, if I'm going to go soliciting that listing, then and, and I'm going to call, remember the seller is going to all be subject to the federal do not call list, okay? So the, the federal do not call registry says, says that MLS specifically does not constitute that, that 18 month relationship you know did you have a relationship with the seller in the past 18 months and the fact that it was in the mls does not constitute that relationship so so you got federal do not call list issues um, but then the other thing is if if you do call um and assuming that it is appropriately so then make sure that when you call that that you know you confirm with them that they have not listed with someone else because a lot of times the the second agent perhaps or even the even the current agent may still have you know a new listing or or a, a different agreement that's in place but you never want to solicit the listing of another broker okay that's just going to be a violation on a, on a number of different levels um, so you always want to ask the question have you relisted your property with someone else um, and, and if they answer yes, then you say, thank you so very much. I look forward to seeing you in the MLS and I'll see what I can do about bringing you a buyer and you need to end that conversation. You do not solicit the listing of another agent. Okay. All right. So that's my expires are kind of dangerous that way. So uh, we want to watch out for that. Um, I, I've, I've had people that would send out um, 
uh, pre-listing packages to uh, sellers, um, anticipating a listing expiring. They would look at it, the listing date, and then they would add 90 days to it, and they would expect that it would expire right after that. Well, that would, on all of my listings, that would clearly be a violation because I all of my listings are six months. So, you know, if you're thinking 90 days, you send a pre-listing packet, you've solicited my list. And so that's going to be a violation. All right. So, okay. Um, and I represent a lot of attorneys, by the way. <laughs> so you know, they, they love this kind of stuff. So, Expiration extension and renewal listing shall be removed from the active inventory on the expiration date uh, unless you've renewed it. And again, you must have a written uh, renewal. Uh, so a written renewal of it. And I'm going to show you where that can get it. That can be a ticket as well. Um, don't be extending it just because, you you know, the seller is a buddy of yours um, because, you know, we, we get that listing where we see, you know, at the MLS level, we see, oh, two listings, different brokers. Oh, that's really weird. What happened there? Well, the one listing expired and the other one showed up as a new listing, but, but then this guy continued the listing. And it's like, well, that, that's going to be the, the suspect listing. Okay. Um, so they're going to be asking you for a copy of that extension. So, you know, in your, in your zip forms program, you know, you have the modification of terms that you would use, or you could have the extension of time addendum. You know, there's other, other ways that you can extend that listing, but you must have something in writing from the seller authorizing you to do that. If you go putting it back in the MLS, then you know you, you and you don't have that extension. You don't have a listing. You're gonna you're gonna be uh, you're gonna be in trouble. Okay. So uh, written authorization from the seller to renew the listing, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, let's see anything else in here uh, at the listing brokers option. The expired listing may be brought back on the market in the MLS database within 30 days. Of course, right? Uh, if it if it truly expired. Now, if they if they see that you know a pattern of that kind of behavior, they may end up calling you and saying, "Hey, send us a copy of that listing agreement." And as I said earlier, you want those dates to line up, folks. Okay, so there's not a good time to commit forgery. Okay, all right. So uh, here it is, 24 hours. So you've got to do that uh, uh, within 24 hours. False or misleading uh, advertising and representations, true pictures, standards of conduct. Um, you know, clearly we don't want to engage in any false advertising. You know, for the longest time, we'd have people say, well, it's got, you know, panoramic ocean views. But of course, the only way to have that was if you were standing on the uh, toilet in the master bedroom looking through this hole, you know, in the wall. Uh, and uh, and so a lot of people got upset about that. So I think whether it's a violation or not, I think we still need to be nice to each other and we need to uh, cast it in its proper light. OK. Um, all right. So uh, let's see. Bum, 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 and you can read all this, all this stuff that I'm looking at. I'm more than happy to send this to you. Send me an email. I will send you the whole package. Okay. So that's my, that's my listing. This is just some common stuff that goes on in listings. Um, let's go back to the PowerPoint. I've got some stuff up here. I'm really excited to show you, but uh, let me get back to my, uh, um, so here, here was the, the, the page that I went to in the, uh, in the SDMLS website. Okay. Easy enough to find. Right. Um, and then we also have a corresponding part, which uh, go back to my PowerPoint for that because we talked about SDMLS and let's talk about S SDAR. Okay, so those are the two ways that I'm going to find things. So I'm going to go to the SDAR website. Uh, where is it? Here we go. And I'm going to click on that. Oh, I haven't logged in yet. Darn it all. Okay, I'm usually pretty good about that. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. Um, and then what am I going to do? I'm going to go to Paragon down here. This is called single sign-on. I'll frequently go this way. And the reason that I'll do that is because it also contains a lot of stuff that, that I'm looking for. When I go to the, the webpage for the San Diego Association of Realtors, it, it kind of tells me what's going on if you follow what, I, what I'm saying here. Um, and so, like, for example, the fact apparently I, my, I, I owe a bill. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I pay all my bills. Why would I pay? Oh, that's the MLS bill. Okay. Yeah. So we're good on that. So, okay. So it, this is called single sign on. So from this page, you can get all these things. Okay. So, you know, and then they're all, all negotiated for you. The, the, the free version of course um, is, is all available to you. So Paragon and, and, and you got uh, Paragon uh, uh, connect. You've also got connect MLS You've got your zip forms. You can have single sign on. So you can come here, click on this, and it takes you right. So you don't have to keep entering usernames and passwords on stuff. Okay. So, um, so that's what, you know, so I'm going to go in here to Paragon because I want to show you where the rules are within Paragon. And a lot of people, it's just surprising to me how much, you know, how many of us are in real estate and never knew these things were here. So here's my main page. Yes, you can see it. Okay. See right up here where it says MLS documents. I'm going to click on that. 
So it's going to have my MLS folder in here. And, you know, when you have time, you should probably take a look at some of these things. Um, and then down here at the bottom, it's got our MLS uh, input forms. I think we should change the name of the folder because we're trying to keep the two separate, but, but all right. Then we have the rules and regulations forms, and I'm going to click on that. Um, and I'm going to show you all the forms here in a second, just generally. So here's a whole bunch of forms, some of which we didn't see on the, uh, on the page uh, here for uh, SDMLS. All right. So, you know, good stuff. Uh, where did I go? I lost it. There it is. So um, again, MLS documents up here. And so let's take a look. And I've downloaded all of these. So you don't have to sit here and wait for them to, to load up. OK, so um, let me take you to the uh, uh, these are all the things that I have downloaded uh, so that you would see it. I've seen uh, I've got listing refresh. These are all the forms. So I want to take you to those forms now, go through the forms. And then I want to get into the, the, the balance of the PowerPoint, which is uh, not really that difficult. So uh, new share. Um, whoops, I did it backwards. OK, so um, let's see here. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, my my uh, listing refresh is covered in here. We don't really want you refreshing a listing. Um, essentially, agents were arbitrarily taking the listing out of the MLS and then putting it back in again. So our rule says you may not do that for 30 days. OK, um, so I'm going to get rid of this one again. I'll send you this whole package. Um, here's one of my favorites. And this is the uh, MLS citation schedule of fines. And so and why do I say that? Because because really for me, and it looks like I have a, a different version. So, so for me, I, the, the, I know that we can't find someone unless we tell you what that fine is going to be. And again, this is only a couple of pages. Okay. So, you know, so in, in uh, looking this up, what have I got? I've got, uh, where can I see how many pages I have? Linda, uh, three pages versus the DMV manual again, which is, you know, a book. Okay. So when I look at the schedule of fines, I'm going to look at, you know, starting at the top, I'm going to see the violations may result in a hearing with a possibility of a penalty in excess of the fine. I mean, you blatantly did something, and I'm going to talk about a couple of those uh, examples here today. Um, in the uh, stated in the schedule, including disciplinary action and termination of MLS services. All right. So what does that mean? That means we 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 normally, and again, I love our MLS. Normally, our MLS will issue a warning. Um, uh, some things are automatic. Some things will automatically be warned um, when you input your listing, for example. So that's normally the violation is on the seller's agent side. So um, you input the listing. Uh, for example, you don't put a picture in. Um, it's going to let you know immediately that you didn't put a picture in. Uh, and it's going to remind you that you've got three days to put a picture in. Otherwise, you're going to get a ticket. It's like 150 bucks. OK. Um, and then other things like you didn't put room dimensions in there and stuff like that. And there's really no waiver for these things. Um, but again, usually the first you know thing is going to usually be a warning. Um, and I say usually because I'm going to talk about a couple of things where it's clearly not a warning um, and, and partially because you were exposed to this when you got your when you joined the association. Because remember, your relationship with the MLS is by contract, right? You've signed a contract with them that says I will follow these rules. And I'm going to show you those in just a second. OK, but 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 since I'm on this topic, so, you know, usually it's a warning on the first shot. Um, you might get a second warning, but they kind of get a little irritated at a certain point, like you're not paying attention to that. Now, I've had people that were just clearly not paying attention. Um, in fact, I, I was management, I've uh, been management at three of the largest brokerages in town, and, and I was management at one of them. And one of our brokers, um, they turned off his MLS and is like, <laughs> and so I'm like, what did you do? And so it turns out he, he had his habit of inputting listings in a certain way that that was a violation. And, and uh, he was warned and, and he ignored it. He was warned again and he ignored it. And so on the third warning, they just said, eh, that's enough. Uh, you know, from now on, all of your listings, you're going to have to have Kevin put them in. I, I don't have time for that. Right. And so needless to say, you know, he got a ticket, the whole thing. And so then I, I said to him, you know, I, I educated him on that. Um, and so I said, you get a hold of the MLS and you contact them and you say, hey, you know, what can I do to make this good? Uh, and at the time, the, our rules enforcement, uh, the, the head of our rules enforcement was Dana Moore. And I love Dana. I've known her for probably at least 25 years since she had her child, which is like, oh, my God, it was so, you know, not that long ago. And, and now the kid's in college. And it's like, wow. Anyway, you know, Dana's, Dana talked to this uh, 
uh, individual and, and said, you know, you're going to have to attend one of Kevin's uh, uh, classes on MLS. And so, you know, of course, that was the most humiliating thing for him was to admit that somebody else might have known more than he does. Remember, there's always somebody that's going to know more than you do. Don't don't let that hurt your hurt your feelings or anything. But literally he had to sit in my class. He sat in the very back of the room, slouched down in the chair <clears throat> and I picked on him the entire time. But, you know, all in all in jest. Um, and uh, and he sat through my class, and so they waived the restrictions. So so again, you know, uh, you know, we don't want you in trouble for stuff. We're not intending to be a punishing agency. And and as I said earlier, we look at ourselves and we look at the MLS as an educational tool. Okay, so we just we're just looking for integrity. That's all. So so um, so for him, sure, uh, termination of MLS services, they cut him off completely. Okay, um, uh, so. Okay, so let, let's talk about some other stuff. So if you get a citation, all right, um, you can always appeal the citation. They don't say that here, but but you can you can appeal it. Um, uh, they they they're really good about not you know again you got a warning and then you did it again and then and then finally you just upset them enough that you got a citation um, and so you know you can appeal it all right um, but I would suggest you not get to that level in the first place. Um, it's just not that common. We're not we're we're not here to write tickets. Okay, we're not trying to produce revenue. You know, we really want to be an educational group. So um, so if you violate one of these things, as we're going to talk about here in a second, um, then you. Know, the first offense is going to have a fine associated. So failure to notify participants. So <clears throat> the MLS doesn't have members. We have participants. We have subscribers. The only member is really the broker um, of the company. And so each of us is a subscriber or participant. So failure to notice. And these are, so you notice the section on the left-hand side, 7.2. So when we look at the rules in a minute and we go to 7.2, we're going to see that it talks in 7.2, it talks about this. And then over here, it says, this is what happens when you violate that. So failure to notify participants of exclusions to exclusive right listing. So in other words, you, you took a listing on a property, the, uh, the seller had been listed before, the seller provided you with a list of those people that, that were excluded from you know, because they, they were listed before and that and, and they uh, and, and and the previous seller's agent notified the seller that that they were going to hold out on these people that they physically introduced to the property, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so you got that list as the new agent uh, with the listing and you failed to let people in the MLS know that there are exclusions in that listing. It's really kind of that simple. OK, but it's a five hundred dollar ticket. All right. So let's, let's use this one as an example. The second offense. So you do it again. Now, frankly, I don't know a lot of people that actually, you know, uh, keep the list of of, of uh, exclusions. You have to provide it before the listing expires. That's the rule in the MLS rule in the uh, in the form. You have to provide the seller with that list prior to expiration. Okay, in the old days, it was you know three to three or five days afterward, but not anymore. So. So you, you did it once, um, you're probably gonna get a warning, but you might get a ticket. If you get a ticket, you can appeal it, you know, use your judgment, talk to your broker, call the MLS, let them know is that, wow, I didn't realize it. Uh, why'd you ignore the warning? You know, you get to go through all that, okay? The second offense within the year, we're gonna double it, okay? So, you know, so if you do it a second time, you got tagged the first time and then you do it a second time, it's gonna be, you know, another 500, it's gonna be $1,000. So you paid 500 and then you paid another 1,000 and so people ask me all the time, it's, it's like, our, let's, let's take a look at the lockbox, because that's the big one. That's the one I want to really get. There's no warning on this one, by the way. Um, so the, the lockbox right here, 13.2, use of a smart card other than the registered owner. So you let somebody else use your MLS access, whether it's your card or your, your username and password you know, on your mobile device or whatever, someone other than you, because that smart card is, is your thumbprint it's yours. <clears throat> so you lent it to somebody else. Um, I'm not aware of a warning on that. The ticket's 2,500 bucks. So they take it really, really seriously. So do not be lending your card to people, period. And so whenever I would do my presentation for new member orientation, I would always say, you know, the first offense, 2,500 bucks. Uh, you know, if you didn't get it and you do it a second time, we're going to double it. So now it's five thousand dollars. So you're twenty five hundred the first time plus five thousand the second time. You're seventy five hundred dollars into this ticket. OK, 
okay? Um, and the reason I'm showing you all this is because you can find this readily. I can show you exactly what you can get. And, and this is a good guide for you to look at so that you know that you're not breaking these rules. But anyway, now you're 7,500 bucks into it. So in the new member orientation, they would always ask me, they would say, what happens the third time? And I, I would respond, we don't know. Nobody's ever done it a third time. Usually 7,500 gets your attention. I would have kind of thought that 2,500 would have gotten your attention, <clears throat> but literally we make such a big thing out of it that I don't know how you didn't know it all together. Okay. So going back up to the top, and I'm not going to read each one of these to you, um, multiple property entries, you know, you got the property in under uh, vacant land and you have it under a, a house. Um, you didn't get a variance on it. Late submission. Remember, all listings must be input into the MLS within 48 hours of all of the necessary signatures. Okay, and this is on residential one to four and on vacant lots within San Diego County, at least. Okay, so they have to be in the MLS within 48 hours, right? Um, and by the way, that's the general rule. That time period of 48 hours is applies to the listing the first time. Everything else after that is 24 hours. Okay, so kind of an easy one to remember. So, you know, if you miss it, <clears throat> By a day, it's a hundred bucks, you know, um, thousand dollar maximum. Um, but but uh, failure to submit the authorization to exclude. <clears throat> I think we need to update this because the authorization to exclude form is really the form that um, that uh, only uh, MLS onlys would fill out, right? We would use the SELM form, which is the uh, which is the seller's instruction to exclude the listing from the MLS. Right. So, uh, in fact, I think I'm going to be showing you that form. Yeah, I have it up here, but I want to show you that authorization to exclude first. Uh, residential styles, appendix. Oh, here we go. So uh, this is my authorization to exclude. You're not going to use this form because this form is only for those people that are subscribers to the MLS that are MLS only. This was the form we all used, but then the MLS says, you know, we're getting tired of rewriting all these forms. And so this one here, uh, unless you're an MLS only, you wouldn't use this form. Instead, you're gonna use the, the uh, SELM form, which is gonna be this form, which is uh, a, a, a really good form, I think. Um, and, and so, you know, obviously you're going to fill in the, the fields up at the top. Um, you're going to put in SDMLS because this is a statewide form. Um, and then you're going to read all this stuff, which is also, by the way, included in your listing agreement. So it's not like you didn't have more than one exposure to it. It's pretty important. All right. So, you know, impact of opting out. We want everybody to understand, did you give the world an opportunity to bid on that property? Because, you know, we want to watch out fair housing violations, steering, you know, all these kinds of things that can happen to us can create a real problem, not only for us, but also for the public, right? And that's one of the things we're trying to do is protect the public. So, so we try to tell a seller there's a big advantage to having it in the multiple listing service. Um, mandatory, mandatory submission to the MLS. So we're going to we're going to tell the seller that 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 we are obligated by contract to put the property in the MLS. The seller can, the seller may not make an agreement with us that has us violate a rule, right? So so. Um, so we tell the seller that we have an obligation. Um, if we take the listing and we don't market it to the public, we still need to provide the form. So we have to provide a copy of the listing agreement as well as a copy of the uh, this form, the SELM form, um, to rules at sdmls.com. And I'm going to show you that in print in a minute um, within 48 hours. So you're either going to send them send the listing into the MLS within 48 hours or you're going to uh, send a copy of the of the listing agreement and the authorization, this, this seller's instruction, exclude the listing uh, to the MLS, uh, the rules, rules at SDMLS. So, so if you're not going to put it in the MLS, then you're going to send the rules, these two documents, your listing agreement and this document. Okay. Um, and then, and then really so we do subscribe to clear cooperation. So there's nothing for you to do here. We, you have to put it in the MLS. Um, you're not going to check 3D because we have adopted the NAR's clear cooperation policy. So there's nothing for you to do in 3D, right? Four, um, the seller might instruct you to exclude the property from the MLS, um, but it may be for the, the way that it, that it was legitimately in the past. You know, the seller's having the property painted, but trying to get rid of a difficult tenant, you know, things like that. And the uh, the seller, uh, you know, the seller would would not want us. So, for example, um, you know, we have one. We we listed it yesterday and and uh, but the seller says, um, you know, I don't want it in the MLS until Friday. 
So, you know, two days, 48 hours, we're not willing to, you know, we don't like cutting corners or, or testing the line. So, you know, we sent a copy of the listing agreement along with a copy of this form completed to the uh, MLS, to rules and MLS. And we checked box number A and we put in Friday's date. Everybody good with that? So that listing will go hot on Friday. Okay. All right. Now, um, or B, for B, don't market it at all. All right. So people ask me all the time, well, why would you even take a listing? Uh, you know, well, sometimes the seller says that <clears throat> I don't want you marketing the property, but I do want you to have a listing. I'm going to always encourage you to get the listing. I mean, get the listing. Um, but, you know, you take a six month listing and three months later, the seller says, OK, I'm ready to put it in the MLS. I'm ready to put it on the market. Get a written instruction from the seller. OK, so maybe a modification of terms, something, you know, that you got out of zip forms, um, you know, something like that that says, I want to go hot now. OK, um, and you need to have that writing and the MLS is going to ask you for it. Right. Um, so then you're going to put it into the MLS. Is everybody OK with that? Um, but I need a written instruction from the seller before I start putting properties into the multiple listing service. Is everybody OK with that? Want to make sure we're clear. All right. Uh, hi, Linda. Welcome. Kayla, welcome back. Um, OK, seller signs it. Uh, broker or office manager. I want to make this really clear. Broker or office manager signs this, not the agent. So the broker or office manager does that. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Questions? Questions? Give me the opportunity to get a drink of water. Okay. Seeing none again, if you have a question, Q&A field would be wonderful. Okay. So I'm going to close that window. Um, and I want to take us back to uh, my schedule of citations and stuff. Um, so again, you want to go through this. You want to read through it. Um, and again, but 7.6 was essentially intended towards uh, MLS only. So we use the SELM form. Um, but here's all, you know, the listings marked withdrawn may not be reentered into the system as new within 30 days because you know, we we're trying to avoid that refreshed listing, you know, where, where, you know, the property's not selling. Well, so I'll just take it out of the MLS and I'll just put it back in as a brand new listing. I wouldn't do that because, you know, they're keeping track of that. Uh, and uh, first of all, you shouldn't be doing that anyway, but you know, what agents do it, I get it, but you know, it is going to be a violation. It is, it is going to, it'll get you a ticket. Okay. Um, so uh, within 30 days by the same brokerage firm, you know, I, I've seen people trading off with partners. I know I had a complaint the other day, people send me the complaints all the time and I'm fine with that. I don't have a problem with that. Um, a lot of times they just don't know really where to send it. And so I'll kick it upstream to, you know, where it belongs, but, but essentially the, you know, the, the two team members were trading the listing back and forth to each other and it just hadn't gotten caught. So, um, but somebody complained and that's, so we don't have a police department at the MLS, right? We have we had administrators who handle, you know, the, the operation of, of the organization, but they're not police. They don't have time to go through all this stuff. They really count on you and I to give them input whenever there's something. You know, I, I had somebody come into my office. Um, uh, this goes back a couple of years now. She comes walking in. I've just identified as the MLS guy. Comes walking in. She got a copy. She printed a copy of a listing. She had all these red arrows on it and all that stuff. And she says, this is a violation. Report it. And she slaps it on my desk. And I go, well, what do you want me to do with it? She says, well, you're the MLS, report it. And I said, well, I'm not the MLS. Um, why don't you report it? And she says, well, I don't want to be a snitch. And I said, well, what are you doing to me? You know, I don't have a problem with it. You know, I'm, I report things all the time, right? I mean, I get people send me a listing, you know, not an MLS yet. And so I'm going to forward that to rules. And I'm going to say, you know, can you look this one up? Make sure that it's in compliance. And you know what, folks, 99% of the time, the, the agent just didn't know or, or they... You know, but again, once you start marketing the property to the public, clear cooperation says you must put it in the MLS within 24 hours. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So uh, rather than going through all this, we'll take our whole day doing this. Um, I'm just going for some highlights. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Um, uh, variable range listing. I had a conversation with a broker this morning. Variable range listing language shall be included in the first $250. Well, 250 should have been over here on the right in the first line of the remarks section, right? Seller will entertain offers between. And again, if you're going to take such a listing, make sure it says it in your listing agreement, okay? Uh, unilateral offer, a contractual offer of compensation. Um, I, I think you should say unconditional offer of compensation. Um, I had a, a case where the uh, uh, the agent, good agent, uh, came to me and said, you know, I, I I wrote an offer on this property. It's got, um, uh, you know, it it, uh, it showed 4% commission to to us, the buyer side. And uh, he says, then I got the commission instructions from escrow and it said 3%. 
And I said, okay, well, what happened when you called them? And they said, well, that's what the broker told them to do. And I said, what happens when you call the broker? And he says, he hung up on me. I go, really? And so I, so I called the broker. I knew him, right? I called him up on the phone. I said, you know, I've got you know, one of our agents here wrote an offer on your listing at such and such. And, and, uh, um, and, and so I said, you know, you, you, you owe him 4%. He's got a printing of the listing. So folks, I'm going to tell you always before you write an offer on a property, print a copy of the listing at or about the time that you wrote the offer. They have to pay you whatever's in the MLS at that time. Um, so we want to avoid, you know, now again, remember your MLS knows, you, uh, and, and wait till I finish the story, you're going to know they really know. So, so here's the thing. So I said, you're going to need to pay him 4%. So, you know what, you hung up on me, you know, that's kind of rude. Right. So, you know, so what did I do? I said, uh, I said, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how, but the Santa Corps at the time was our MLS. And so Santa Corps, uh, called, apparently called him on the phone and said, you know, you, you, uh, you put it in the MLS at 4%. We don't care what your listing says, you know, you, your, your MLS said 4% and they, and they printed a copy of it. And, and we're looking in our database and we see that you changed it in the MLS after the offer got accepted. Okay, so it gets better. So, so anyway, you're paying four percent. So I got our agent the four percent. Well, then of course, because you, you you really don't want to make you know some people angry, right? So you know the the uh, the the MLS went in and they looked and they and they found a pattern of behavior of this person doing that. Now I don't know what the ultimate. I think it was like a fifteen hundred dollar fine, and this was back when fifteen hundred dollars was a lot of money. But but essentially there was a pattern of putting them in at the higher commission split and then changing it when the when the listing uh, you know when it went pending. Um, um, and so, but, you know, nobody's going to know unless somebody says something. And so that's going to be really, really important. So clearly that would have violated the rule, right? I mean, you're going to pay, it's called an unconditional offer of compensation. Uh, and I think that's uh, 7.12 should be changed to that, but changes to offer of compensation and 1.6 cover or point. 0.16 covers it. Um, let's see what else. Uh, failure to publish uh, all properties capable of being sold separately. So you so you you uh, list five contiguous lots of land. Uh, you you have to uh, let everybody know that that the properties can be purchased individually. So what people normally do is they put five different listings uh, and then they refer each to the other that the seller would maybe prefer to sell all five as a bundle, but, but they can be sold separately. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, this is good. So 1.9 again, thousand dollars. You, you didn't get the a written authorization from the seller before extending or renewing the listing. And that's what we talked about earlier written. Okay. So we call that express. Okay, uh, uh, failure to disclose existence of a dual or variable commission agreement. So in other words, you made a deal with the seller at the time of the listing that you would, uh, if, if, if you brought in the buyer, you would do the sale for a reduced commission on the buyer's side normally. Um, so it's called the CVR field in your MLS. So you have an obligation to put that into your, your listing to let everybody know that there is going to be a CVR. There's going to be a variable rate commission. If I sell it myself, then I'm going to uh, uh, charge less for that. So you need to know that because otherwise they've got a, a competitive unfair advantage over you. So one of the first things I do, I call the other agent and I say, uh, you know, I'm going to bring you an offer on this property. And they say, good, get it in here. We've got uh, 15 offers. Or I'll say, how many offers do you have? And they'll say, I've got 15. They have to tell you. OK. And then the next question right away, write this down. Next question is, how many of those are yours? OK. And they have to tell you. All right. And if they don't tell you, you need to get you need to report it. OK. How many of those are yours? And then finally, did you give the seller a break on any of those commissions? OK. On any of those transactions. And so, again, they have to tell you. So that's why we have these fields. OK. Uh, uh, you input the listing uh, 8.1. You input the listing without having a, a listing agreement. That's going to be a big one. Um, <clears throat> the MLS asked you for something and you didn't give it to them within 24 hours. That's going to be a thousand dollars and or suspension, uh, and then the accuracy of information. You know, you, so remember puffing is in used cars. Puffing is not in real estate. Um, and again, as a practitioner like you, you know, I don't work for the MLS, but as a practitioner like you, I see these things all the time. It's like, I don't know if I really would have said that, right? Or or, or even you're inputting the listing. And uh, I, I had a case uh, where the, uh, um, the uh, seller put in that the property was on sewer. Um, well, there's a big difference between sewer and septic. It's like five grand a foot, okay? Uh, so they put in that it was on sewer. In fact, it turned out it was on septic. So needless to say, there was a lawsuit, right? Um, 
you know, the other one, property boundaries, you know, uh, how far back does the property go? Well, it goes all the way to the fence. Don't ever say that. I always, you know, and I have a lot of court cases on that. So, so, you, you know, listen, I say good fences make good neighbors. They make lousy property boundaries. So, you know, don't tell people that the property goes back to the fence. OK, because it probably doesn't. All right. And, and I had a case on that where literally there were two properties before you got to the fence. So ugh. anyway, it can be very expensive. Um, failure to conduct appointments for showings. Five hundred bucks. Presentation of offers. That's why we have that thing. You know, the offer was presented on. You got your your offer form. You know, if they're not responding to you, then, you know, I would talk to your broker uh, and have your broker call their broker. OK, because they need to be responding to you. All right. And if not, report it to the MLS. All right. Uh, submission of offers, change of compensation offer by the cooperating broker. Um, OK, so on and on. Uh, again, I promise you I was only going to look um, media uh, must be of the subject property view from the property or the amenities, not from you know, not panoramic whitewater ocean views. But, you know, this unit's in the back of the complex. It has no view at all. Um, and then they put in their written permission required for use of media. And I've had cases on this. Believe it or not, you know, here, here the agent goes out and spends a lot of money having pictures taken of a property. Listing expires. Number two agent gets the listing and then copies all the pictures. Um, that's going to be a big, that's going to be a, a bad thing. Okay. So I, I had it happen personally to me. I, I represented, uh, of course, I represent a lot of attorneys. I represent an attorney, sold his house. Uh, and, uh, and next thing you know, a broker sends flyers around the neighborhood saying, you know, you know, sold, sold this house. Well, you didn't sell the house. And secondly, use my picture. Well, you know, for me, it's like, listen, I got other things going on. Well, the seller was an attorney and a real estate broker and the seller went after this person. I assure you, they will never do that again, <laughs> but, but I'm telling you, they were just determined to get them. So, uh, anyway, you don't want, uh, this is like making a horde at now, you know, angry, right? You don't want to do that. Okay. Um, and yeah, I talked earlier, uh, failure to submit a photograph or rendering um you know if, if you don't have a house there if it's a construction rendering then do that but you got 72 hours you got three days okay misuse of the remarks you put something in there like open house on saturday or uh contact seller directly those are going to be violations you put your phone number we have software that looks for that it's data checker uh trying to think of the name of it offhand, but but it does search for those kinds of things because I want to show you the top 10 most frequently violated things in a minute. Um, uh, improper placement of for sale signs, you know, stuff like that. I see what else. Uh, um, you know, you didn't ask the, the, you asked, you know, you wanted to advertise another broker's listing, uh, but you forgot to get written permission. Okay, now that's going to be a no-no. And that, by the way, that includes the internet. Um, and I know that the Department of Real Estate looks at that. Um, you know, we, we have... Uh, a thing going on right now where real estate agents will go through somebody else's listing, taking pictures and then put those pictures up on their website um, and saying as an example of properties that we have available, you know, that kind of thing. The DRE is going after those. So, uh, I, you know, I, I just kind of figure, you know, speaking of that Hornet, let's, I probably wouldn't make them angry. Uh, false advertising. Uh, let's see. Uh, unauthorized use. of you know, you gave somebody your, your access to the MLS. Got not going to be a good thing. Um, smart card, we already covered that. Putting a lockbox on a property, you must have written permission for that. So um, your your listing agreement has is by default says yes, it's okay. Seller says put a box on there. There's a check box for don't put a box on there. You need to honor that. And then if you have a tenant in the property, you need to have that KLA form signed by the tenant. Uh, and uh, uh, otherwise, it's going to be a big ticket. You can't just go putting a lockbox on a property. That's against the rules. Okay. Um, um, all right. Uh, I, uh, 13.6. I, I, I had a house I owned uh, on Portofino in Del Mar and uh, prior to closing and, and, and the broker that represented the buyer, um, a good friend of mine, known her for decades. Um, and, uh, you know, we the house hasn't sold yet. We go down to pick up the refrigerator and the buyer is already in the house remodeling it. And they were doing a good job, man. They were really flying. And I said, what are you doing? They said, remodeling, we're remodeling our house. I said, it's not your house. It hasn't closed yet. It hasn't recorded yet. And so they're great big fight. They put their truck in the way so I couldn't get anything out. I called the other broker and I said, you've got a situation here. And so needless to say, they moved their truck, got everything out of the way. You don't own it until you own it. Where was the violation of this? The agent, the, the buyer's agent gave the buyer the key prior to closing. Do not do that. 
Okay. So I see it all the time. You know, uh, um, we have agents contact us. Are you okay if I take the key out of the box? And the answer is, you know, we may not have a problem with that, but you do not give it to your buyer until after you have confirmation of recordation. Does everybody go with that? That's my schedule of fines. It's not that, you know, it's three pages, not even big print, can't miss it. I would go through this. Okay. Uh, questions, uh, seeing none. Uh, then we have our uh, rules enforcement policy. So obviously compliance, reporting of rules violation, formal complaints. We have a form. I'll show you that in a second. Um, uh, if you get complained against, you need to respond. Hello, you need to respond, right? I, I know, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to, to uh, the Department of Real Estate the other day and they said 80% of the outreach, they call them outreaches, um, that they outreach to a broker about, you know, a potential problem 80% of the time, they don't get a response. I don't know, folks. I'm just kind of thinking that if the DRE reaches out to me, I'm I'm gonna I'm driving down there. I'm gonna stand in front of them. How are you? I'm Kevin, right? <laughs> I, I just don't get it. I mean, they're not, you know, they're not trying to 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 string you up. They just they have a question. You need to answer the question. Okay. Um, so then there is an appellate, uh, you have the ability to appeal. Um, they rarely ever go to appeal. Non-response, not a smart thing. <laughs> okay, they're going to terminate you. Uh, anonymous complaints, um, you know, um, they don't like that. Um, and when you submit a complaint in your MLS, and I'm going to show you uh, how to do that in just one second, but um, the respondent, integrity of the database, that's what we're all about. Violation, the same rule, we talk about all that, okay? So here's the formal rules violation report, but you really, I don't think you need to do all that. I think you could just, you know, usually you're just asking a question, right? So, uh, and for me, you know, I don't go around looking for things, um, but if I see something, then I'm going to probably say something. Um, here's the rules and department policies. So room, room dimensions are required. All right. Now, I always tell you, you know, whenever you go out on a listing appointment, you always want to bring a, a camera uh, because they want a picture. And you also want to bring a tape measure. I mean, I'm, I'm older. You see this a tape measure. Um, and I always tell, you know, I always have the seller help me measure the rooms. Um, yeah, I'm not into all that, you know, pushing buttons and, and that. So, you know, I'll usually hold the, 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 uh, the end of the tape measure and I always tell the seller you're holding the business and they say, what does that mean, the business end? And I say, that's the end we get sued on. So they go, they get sued on it. And so now everybody's going to be really careful, right, about that uh, end of the tape measure. So you need to put them in there, you know, your decision. We don't have, we, we have inches. We don't have, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, we have uh, feet. We don't have inches. So, you know, your, your call, round up, round down, do whatever. Uh, but your MLS requires it, so you're going to have to do it. Uh, let's see what else in here. Uh, um, if, if your seller has accepted an offer, it needs to go pending uh, unless there's a third party involved in the decision to sell. Um, and in that case, you would go contingent. OK, so a bank, uh, you know, a, a short sale or a corridor sale or something like that. Um, and then the rest of this, I'm going to let you read this on your own. Um, uh, yeah, this is good stuff. I would say get into that. Uh, I do want to get back to my PowerPoint. So here's rules every member should know. And this is just a handful of things. And again, these are all on the websites where I was talking, showing you earlier. But, you know, new listings entered within 48 hours. Exclusion forms. We have an online submission. I want to show you that. Let me take you to that really quick because I think that's really cool. And and uh, and and thank you to Elise who actually sent me, uh, um, uh, reminded me of the link. Uh, where did it go? Uh, at least where is it on? I saved it. Um, okay, well, let's go back up here. Let's do it this way. Uh, listing um, uh, uh, exclusion, right? So online submission, here it is. I went, I, I'm on the SDMLS website. I clicked on listing exclusion. Here it is. I click on the form and it, and it pops up um, with this. So you can actually submit your exclusion online. Um, you know, down here, you would upload your SELM form. You have to have authorization by the seller to do it. It's not your decision, right? And then, and then uh, obviously copy the listing and then, and then submit it. So you're going to put in the listing date, the expiration date. Uh, and I'm looking for a listing number when I don't see it uh, because it won't be right. Cause you won't have a listing yet. So anyway, I wanted you to be aware of that. Good. Okay. We're covering a lot of stuff here, folks. Uh, let me see here. So thank you again to Elise for that. That was exciting. Um, so again, that's my uh, rules that you should know. There's my 72 hour photos, 
room dimensions. There's no grace period. Um, and sometimes you can't get into the property because the, you know, the tenant won't let you in or something like that. Um, but, but uh, I would probably save it as a partial listing and probably do the SELM until you can get the room dimensions done. Um, if not, call the MLS and talk to them about it. Uh, and uh, let's see what else. Status changes again, 48 hours to input the listing or send in the exclusion, 24 hours for everything else. Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, active. Uh, this is interesting because active status, you know, listen, when you've accepted an offer, you need to go either contingent or pending people that say, well, we're waiting for the contingencies to be removed. That's going to be a violation. That's just a normal transaction. So it's either pending or it's going to be uh, contingent, one or the other. <clears throat> um, but but I, I get all kinds of excuses. Um, coming soon status, we talked about that. Um, so if you don't if you don't go active live within 21 days, we're going to do it for you. Um, the the uh, broker certifies that nobody's going to be showing the properties to anyone by anyone, not even the seller's agent. And this is I see this violated a lot. Um, but uh, MLS status must be changed or transferred before allowing the first showing. Any showing the minute you market the property to the public, you've got 24 hours to put it in the MLS as an active listing. That includes showing the property, includes anything outside of your in intranet at your office. Withdrawn, cancel. We talked about that. Clear cooperation. We talked about that. Okay, good. Uh, let's see. Here's the rules themselves. How many pages are there? There are 67 pages. So I said to you earlier, going through this, I see, you know, they're, they're, they're well written. I mean, they're put in, they're, 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 they're codified, all right? They, we do them this way on purpose. Let's go to 7.2, because remember, 7.2 was the one that showed up that we talked about in the very beginning. Uh, let me get you 7.2. So this is uh, 7.1. 7.2, types of listings, responsibility for classifications. So once again, this is the very first thing we saw on the schedule of, of fines, right? So, you know, this is, this is, I just go to 7.2. I look it up in here. Everybody good with that? Questions? Seeing none? Okay, I'm going to get close that one. Um, uh, we have definitions of residential styles, detached, manufacturing home, twin home, town home. A twin home is essentially the same as a duplex. Um, it's just that with a twin home, uh, there are uh, separate um, uh, APM numbers. So a different person owns each side. Uh, on, a, on a duplex, it's the same physical structure, but it's only one APM number. So it's an investment property, okay? Um, and then uh, row homes. I don't think we see a lot of those in San Diego. Uh, one of three or more units that are attached by a facade, a roof, or a walkway. Um, and then all of it attached are going to be our condos and things like that. So uh, good. No questions on that. Uh, moving right along. I showed you this already. Um, I also have an issues briefing paper, if you're interested in it. Uh, changes to the model rules. Um, and this one actually contains the uh, changes that were done very recently, fall of 22. So conflicts between the rules, uh, you can see non-confidential fields, um, a couple of things in here. Again, I'm happy to send all this to you. If you want it, just send me an email, say, send me your package. Um, variance requests. So uh, um, we had this happen. Uh, I, I had a lot of experience with this. Um, I also chaired the uh, Santa Cor, uh, Advisory Committee for um, another association uh, for five years. Um, and uh, uh, in addition to being on the appellate level of things. So, so I remember we had a, a request from someone who said, you know, uh, property's not selling. And so, of course, in my brain, I'm always thinking it's the price, right? But of course, they said, you know, we, we we're advertising it as a house for sale, but it's not selling. We want to also advertise it as vacant land. And so we responded and said, why? Uh, and they said, well, because they responded with the house is uninhabitable. And so we looked up the listing and in the listing, it said there was a tenant in it. So there was a tenant in an uninhabitable house, by the way, in Rancho Santa Fe. OK, so, uh, you know, I mean, what does that look like? Um, and so um, so we gave him the option. We said, you know, do, you could take your pick, but you can't have both because that's just going to mess us up. So, you know, you can either leave it as a house for sale uh, or you can put it in as land. One or the other. We gave them the, the Remember, you want to have that choice in writing from the MLS. Don't just do that. OK, um, that'll be a violation. So you want to get permission, contact the MLS. You might put in a variance request for that. OK, um, but frequently we get the uh, <laughs> excuse me, we get the attached and detached. We want to have it as both. No, you're not going to get that. 
Um, so, you know, what do you want that to look like, et cetera, et cetera. Property type, probably one of the more common ones. Um, and so, you know, they, they, they ended up taking that property out of house for sale and put with our approval and put it into um, vacant land. You know what? It sold right away. It was the right price for land. It was not the right price for a house. So it sold right away as land. And so they were really surprised. Um, but, you know, again, you know, you're going to get you'll, you'll be given options, hopefully. Uh, don't just take it on yourself to do whatever you feel like doing. So, you know, here's the whole breakdown of all that. Um, again, agent signature, broker signature. Uh, I can't believe we're still faxing things back, but okay, I get that. And notice the heading at the top of the form says Sandicor. Sandicor was our old MLS. That should be changed to SDMLS. But Sandicor was the uh, MLS that used to be, you know, nine different associations together. Uh, it is no longer. Then they have a, an admin form, uh, a status and change report form. You're probably not going to use that. You're probably going to do it yourself. Um, but again, with written authorization from the seller to do so. Um, and then we have a listing transfer form. So if you tra transfer brokerages um, and, and, and your broker approves, then you need to get all these people to sign this form that says that you want to do that transfer. The MLS is not going to transfer it to another brokerage without authorization, because remember, the listing belongs to the first broker um, and the first broker can make a decision whether they want to release the listing or not. It's not your decision, unless of course you are the broker. Uh, but if you change brokerage firms, then, then uh, you know, then you've got to get their permission to do that. Is everybody okay with that? Um, so, you know, you would fill this form out, you would have it uh, signed by the, uh, the broker number one, who's letting it go. And then broker number two, who's receiving it. Um, and, and so, Agents all the time will think that they're just okay to take the listings with them when they when they change brokerage firms. That is not the case. The listing belongs to the broker. It's very important to remember that um, it is does not belong to the agent. So you know if, if Scott's the broker and Scott you know moves to another company, um, or I'm sorry, let's, let's do that differently. So Scott's the broker and an agent is there has a listing. Even though the agent might have put their name on the listing, may have put their name up there with the broker's name. That's not going to fly. It belongs to Scott. Okay. So you're going to have to get Scott's permission to release the listing or, and Scott does not have to give you that permission. Scott can say, no, we've got too much into this. We spent a lot of money on this. We're not going to release the listing and you're just stuck because remember the listing belongs to the broker. Now in most brokerages, you know, they want to maintain good faith with members of the public, but a lot of times, you know, just to accommodate the agent, that may not be the appropriate thing to do. So, so anyway, again, that's our uh, uh, SDMLS's listing transfer form. Uh, and uh, that's the last of the forms. So uh, as I'm uh, rounding, whoops, screen sharing has stopped. Okay, now you get to look at a full face of me. Let's go back to um, uh, uh, where do I find the rules? We've covered all this already. Um, what will I find when I get there? And so here's a list of all the things that I pulled up a minute ago and showed you all this. I just decided to go show you rather than go through all these rules and department policies, uh, MLS rules, quick guide, rules every member should know, <clears throat> um, the enforcement policies. Um, again, uh, the, the fine schedule, that's not the very good schedule, that's the fine schedule. Um, and then the authorization to exclude, which is uh, the realtor community will use the CAR form SELM. And then we have our residential styles definitions. Um, how are the violations identified? So let's talk about that for a second. And, and so I just want to take you really quick. I want to show you the um, from the MLS perspective. So I'm going to go back into Paragon really quick and, and let me pull up a, a listing. Um, let me uh, make up a listing and uh, uh, America. I'm just going to pull this out. And this is, uh, um, oh, got rented. Good for you. So I actually used to own this property. I want to get a more current version. Here it is. It's expired. So, you know, I wanted to get a more current version of the listing. And, and this is uh, uh, currently owned by the, the person that I, that I sold it to. So um, so up here, I have a red button. Everybody see that red button? Now, that button used to say report a violation. But then we realized that, you know, we don't know if it's a violation or not. I mean, sometimes I wouldn't know. Like, for example, they may have that uh, exclusion form uh, uh, signed. So, you know, but when I click on correction, correction pops up a window. You'll notice there's, you're not going to redirect this anywhere. This is going to go straight to rules at SDMLS. Okay. So, you know, you put it when you clicked on that listing. Uh, yeah. And so is it anonymous? The answer is to the MLS it is anonymous. They're not going to, you know, start publishing the fact that you turned somebody in. That's not what they do. But but it's not anonymous to them. 
They know you sent it. Why? Because, you know, the MLS knows that you sent it because they may have questions for you. And so, you know, occasionally I'll go in and I'll send one and, and the nice people at the MLS will reach out to me and they'll say, hey, you know what? Uh, we actually have that form on file. And so, you know, thank you very much. Or um, we uh, contacted the agent. Um, they weren't aware. Um, and so uh, they, they are uh, going to fix it. OK. And so, again, a lot of times it's a simple fix. If the MLS calls you, you need to take the call. All right. Uh, you know, so talk to them because they're, they're good people. They're just trying to make sure that our database has integrity to it. That's all. So but but, uh, you know, if you have to send it, a, you know, if you're if you think there might be something wrong, they don't they don't reach out to you, say, what kind of idiot are you? You know, they, they just say, you know what, here's how we handled it. OK, at least that's the way they've always uh, treated me. And you know? so it's a respectful situation, both forward and backward. OK, so you fill this thing in um, and I'm not going to hit the send button because then they're going to go, you know, what's that all about? Of course, I could put in there. This is just a test. But you know they don't need that. So just take my word for it. When you, once you put in what you think might be, and again, I always tell everybody, you know, put it in the form of a question. Um, you know, they, they can't really fault you for asking a question, and they really can't fault you at all. You're you're a paid subscriber. You're paying to be there. You they work for you. So you know, put your question in there, send it to them. Um, and again, you can always send me stuff if you want. I'm happy to do it, but you I won't. This won't go to me. Let's just say that. So I'm gonna hit cancel. Now, because I just want to show you uh, how it is. We don't have a police department. There is no police department that goes through all this. This is essentially, you know, they, they kind of count on you and I to let people know, let them know whenever they, there is a perceived violation. And so you're not a bad person for, you know, reporting a potential violation. That's all. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's go back to my, uh, um, how are they identified? Um, so uh, let's talk about that. They're identified in multiple ways. Violations are identified in multiple ways. Data Checker is the name of the program. It's an automatic software program that identifies the violations such as missing photos. Okay, that it's going to see. You know, we don't need to go in and look at every new listing every night. We have a program that does that. Um, misuse of the remarks section. It's usually going to be you put a phone number in there or you put a, a, a website in there or an email address. So it's looking for those things. Okay, so uh, clearly it's going to be a ticket. Um, it will, clearly they're going to notify you notify you that you have a violation. You didn't put in the room size dimensions. Uh, so really room size, it really it's the room dimensions, right? Not the room size dimensions, because I think size would be uh, the uh, volume. So, so, you know, you, you have length times width, you don't have height, otherwise you would have volume. And that doesn't make any sense unless you're going to plan on filling the room full of water or something like that. Um, okay, so that being said, listings that have not been reported sold final, that happens actually fairly frequently. Um, it's disturbing to know that, you know, I, I know we're all busy, but the list Listing, you know, the, the uh, listing closed and then you were too busy to go back and report it as closed. If you are that busy, you need to hire somebody to do it for you. OK, so, you know, we have uh, um, one of the things we're not going to talk about is that you can have an assistant with assistance access to your MLS, not using your username and password. That's a violation. But, you know, for twenty five bucks a quarter, I think it is they can have their own access, their own number and they can only touch your stuff. OK, so again, they sign up a contract with the MLS, same kind of rules that the rest of us sign as well. Is everybody OK with that? Um, I want to encourage you to do that. Um, at, at my busiest in my career, I had three full time assistants, right, um, of which actually uh, I had uh, one one had access to the MLS. The rest of them didn't need it. OK, so. Um, uh, after close of escrow, obviously, you don't want to report it closed before it closes. Um, I have a, uh, had a lot of what was going to end up being and didn't become a lawsuit uh, uh, where the uh, uh, buyer, uh, the day before closing, the buyer dies. Um, can you imagine? They'd already removed all their contingencies. Um, and, and so the buyer dies. What do you do? Well, you issue a demand to close escrow. <laughs> and so, and of course, the buyer can't respond because the buyer is, you know, El Muerte, as we say. Um, but uh, that one didn't close. Um, that one ended up selling to somebody else. So anyway, it, once you once you close it, report it as closed. Um, there is a correction button within the MLS um, uh, whereby agents that are logged into Paragon, only, only uh, uh, subscribers to Paragon can anonymously report. Again, the, the, they don't call the, the, the offending party and say, you know, guess who turned you 
you in, um, inquire about accuracy of listing data. I do it. I, I, I send in a thing saying, I'm not so sure about this. How does this work? Um, again, always frame it in the form of a question. And I think you're in a lot better shape than if you, uh, um, you know, if you come out, you know, guns blazing, as we say. Um, members can report violations or inquire by email to rules at SDMLS. I promised you I would show you that. Um, I like rules at SDMLS. Um, you know, they're, they're there, they're to help. They're there to teach. Um, I'm hoping that they're friendly, right? I mean, I've never had a bad experience uh, with our MLS, and, and uh, you know, I've uh, I've worked at the, with the top of uh, of the best, and so uh, hopefully you have that same experience. Um, uh, the SDMLS, we're probably going to get done early today, by the way. The SDMLS is dedicated to your success, and they put education first. Um, the goal is for data integrity. That's our whole purpose in life uh, and to work with our subscribers to provide the most current, accurate and up to date information. That's the whole point. At one time, we had a, a thing called shadow zips. Um, we had um, we had agents inputting listings. I, I remember we had one. The property was physically located in Carmel Valley. So the agent inputted into the 92130 zip code. But it, it was close to Del Mar, so they inputted a second time in 92014, and then, and then it had the look and the feel of a Rancho Santa Fe house, so now they put it in 92067, so it was in three different MLSs. You can only imagine the havoc that that wreaked on the appraisers and the other real estate agents who were looking and saying, I thought I saw that listing over in Del Mar. It's like, it's not in Del Mar, it's in Carmel Valley. So, so again, the shadow zip thing was a disaster. It lasted about four five years. Um, it, it went in under my watch, went out under my watch. I was just uh, thank, so thankful we got rid of that. But but that's kind of what happens when we let people just kind of freewheel it. Um, and so um, at one point, we allowed people to put it in at least one and a continue, contiguous um, zip code. Um, we tried it. We made rules. We did all kinds of stuff. Again, it was a disaster. So uh, it ain't coming back. Don't worry about it. And so uh, my hat is off to Michael Citron out there, who who I just found a picture of him. Uh, but uh, you know, God, we wrangled through that. Oh God. Um, anyway, so um, we suggest you do a quick inventory of your listings. Make sure you don't run into the top ten violations, which I'm going to show you now. I want to talk to you about the top ten things that we see that are violations in our MLS. Okay, so. Uh, um, uh, let's see, top 10 MLS rules violations. So number one, failure to report a listing sold final within 24 hours of close of escrow. So rule 10.2, again, I go to my rules document, I look up 10.2, it, it is a rule, I assure you. So you didn't report it within 24 hours. Remember 48 hours to input the listing after all of the necessary signatures, everything else is 24 hours. Pendings, solds, everything is 24 hours, okay? Um, number two, reporting inaccurate buyer's agent. So uh, um, for example, they, they put in the example, le team leaders, right? Uh, supposedly team leaders. Um, the, the DRE has a particular affinity for team leaders too, by the way. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. But I, I had a property, I wrote an offer for a buyer. Um, the the, the uh, seller's agent who happened, <coughs> excuse me, who happened to be the same brokerage I was in at the time, um, you know, we got the offer accepted, <coughs> excuse me, uh, got the offer accepted. So he was the seller's agent. At that time, we called him the listing agent. I was the selling agent. Today, we call it the buyer's agent. And so, you know, what does he do? He goes in and reports himself as the buyer's agent. So why? Because he was trying to puff up his listings so that he could go on listing appointments and say, look, I double ended all these properties, which was clearly not true because I had brought in the buyer. And so I called him up on the phone and, and, and he knew me very well. And, and, and so I called him on the phone and I said, uh, you know, you reported yourself as the buyer's agent. And clearly I, I brought the buyer in uh, and he said, uh, he said, too bad. And I went, really? And so I don't know how Santa Corps, our MLS at the time, found out about it, but they called him on the phone and they said, did you bring in the buyer? <clears throat> and, and of course, he said, well, yeah, I, I had the listing. And he says, who brought in the buyer? Who was the buyer's agent? And they said, well, Kevin Burke was the buyer's agent. And so they said, OK, you need to give Kevin Burke credit for that. Remember, we've already looked at that rule here, folks. Um, you know, the, you get a ticket for that. OK, so anyway, so he changed it. And, and again, the warning call. Right. Not a problem. 
Um, and then after closing, so remember what I said, you're always going to get a warning. All right. Yeah, well, hopefully not the, not the lockbox thing. You, you give out your smart card, you're on your own. Okay. Uh, you give people access to the listing. You know, we want to protect the public. And, and so if you're just giving arbitrary, you know, uh, access to properties without having uh, those people don't have contracts with the MLS, then, then you, you're going to create a problem. So, so in this case, um, you know, I'm, I'm wandering around, close the transaction, no big deal. And about a month later, I just happened to be going through the MLS looking for, you know, my, my sales. So I can see, you know, how I've been doing, right. Cause I really keep very good track of it. But um, so, and I see that he changed it back to his name. And so I went, really? And so, so the MLS calls him again. And this time they gave him a very big ticket. Why? Because it's like, I told you not to do that. And then, and, and then you agreed and then you went ahead and switched it back. Um, and so the reason I'm telling you the story was because it was the genesis of the system we have today. Once you report a property is sold final, you may not change it. So you want to make sure, folks, that all of your data is correct. You need to review your listings, make sure that everything is correct, because you won't have an opportunity to change it later. The only people that can change it later is the MLS. OK, and so, you know, and sometimes you might, you know, not want that to happen. But now the buyer's agent is calling you on the phone saying you reported yourself as this as the buying as the selling or I'm sorry, as the buyer's agent. When if, and you can't change it now because you've already reported it as closed. So, listen, we want to be honest in all things. We want to watch for that data integrity. Um, and so in, in that situation where that agent switched all back again, you know, that was uh, clearly they knew that it was a violation. They had personally spoken with the MLS uh, who told them not to do that. And so uh, so anyway, big ticket. Um, and so fast forward now um, to where we are today. Now, now you once you've reported it closed, it's closed and you no longer have access to it. You know, I have people calling me up. Can you take those pictures out of the Internet? I can't. I mean, it's closed. Um, in fact, I know we had a, a court case on um, uh, a buyer who wanted to have the property, the stuff taken out. And the MLS has strict rules. They can't do it. So uh, and the court held that they can't do it. So, so it kind of worked out that way. So, you know, team leads. So let's talk about that. Whoever the agent is that produced the sale. Um, you know, and, and I'm aware of brokerages in town, smaller, you know, mom and pop kind of things where the, you know, all of the deals belong to the broker. So in other words, and, and they, frankly, they do anyway, but that broker gets credit for everything and the agents don't get credit for anything. So, all right, I get it. Um, you're probably going to run afoul of some other people as well. The DRE is looking at that um, because you weren't the actual agent that represented the buyer. Um, and so I, I just say, watch out for that. Uh, I know that uh, for the AVID form, for example, on page three of the AVID, um, there's a place for the, uh, the agent who performed the inspection to sign the form. And so the DRE very specifically has said, um, you know, we're going, we're going after teams, you know, because, you know, the, uh, the individual agent did the AVID, but the team leader signed off that they did it. And, and you know what they said? They said, we think that's fraud. And so listen, when they say fraud, I'm just like, run, don't walk, get away from that as fast as you can, because they're saying you didn't do the inspection. You know, you sent, somebody else did it, but you signed the document saying that you did it. It says the, the person who performed the inspection. OK, and so listen, folks, I'm going to tell you a simple little thing. You think that's simple. And, and I agree with the department. I really do. You know, I took a listing up in Lake Forest and, and uh, I, I sat with the seller for three and a half hours, went over all the paperwork with them. Um, and another broker in our office went and, and did the AVID. Uh, but but you know what he signed the avid and his name was on the avid okay so so you know I, I listen I didn't do the avid he signed it and so it, both of us under the same brokerage both of us under Linda uh, everything in compliance okay so you know we're just not going to run foul of that you know I always say you know, always stay on the right side of the guns and badges right you always want to stay on the side that's right um, and and don't be testing the line so anyway that's number two uh, big deal including branded media and virtual tours and photos so. Um, um, so it's interesting how this comes about. <clears throat> so what we'll have is we'll have uh, agents who will um, take pictures of the property, but include a picture of their sign in the yard. So obviously it reveals it's not an anonymous photo. It reveals, you know, that there is, you know, the, who, how to get a hold of the seller's agent. And so they don't want that. That's that's no, it's got to be anonymous. Right. Or we'll see the sign in the window. 
So um, the MLS has software that will redact those things. Um, I always tell people, if you've, if you've taken a picture and the sign is in the picture, go back and take the picture at an angle so that you're looking down the length of the sign so they can't read the, the, the name, you know, who you're with, who you are, stuff like that. Most of the responses I get, are, I want them to know, okay, um, so uh, I probably wouldn't do that, but, but anyway, bottom line is, um, you know, they have software that will redact it. It is not pretty. Okay. When they take it, essentially you've got this blur in the middle of your picture. So, um, as I can't imagine, you know, any of the reputable sign, uh, picture taking companies locally, uh, will have a, uh, you know, if they see the sign, they're going to do everything they can to avoid the sign. And some people say, well, I can't take the sign out of the yard. Okay, well, you can't take a picture of the sign. So, you know, maybe you just work it at an angle on both sides of the sign so they can't see the sign. Um, but people will go to lengths to do crazy stuff. There's a sign in the window. You know, for more information, call. Listen, don't do that. We, we had a... Um, um, uh, actually, it was the same one of the same uh, agents that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, he was a part of a team. Uh, it was him and, and his wife team. Uh, and so yeah, he would take uh, the, uh, uh, you know, when he closed the property, he would have a picture taken of himself and his wife in his convertible Mercedes with a big sign that said another home sold by so and so team. And so needless to say, we put put that shut that down really quick, because again, that's, you know, branded media, and we're not going to allow that. So most most of your companies that are taking your videos, for example, um, will take um, uh, two versions. One of them will be the non-branded media, which can go all over the MLS, you know, assuming within the other rules, um, all over the MLS. But, you know, once you start putting, you know, your, your sign in it or, um, you know, your logo across the bottom of the page or, you know, one of my personal favorites is I, I see agents and very doing it very well where, you know, they're walking through the house and they're discussing the different features of the property. That's a branded tour, folks. Okay. We even have a form called the PVR form um, that if you take a picture of an animal in the house, you need to have the owner's permission to have that picture, picture, animal, children, things like that. You need to have the owner's permission. We have a separate form for that. So, so again, branded media, you can put into your uh, advertising remarks, but you may not put it in the regular remarks. Um, you can put in confidential remarks, um, but, but essentially most of the companies out there are, um, uh, taking uh, two different versions of the of the uh, the video, you know, one version being branded, one being not branded. Does that make sense? Um, anybody have any questions on any of that? Um, um, again, I told you the story earlier about the agent running around, you know, with the picture that I had taken. Um, okay, number four, use of photos that are not of the subject property. So uh, uh, you're selling a house in Del Mar and you uh, take pictures of Powerhouse Park. Or, or Jake's or something like that, right? So use of photos that are not on the subject property or, or worse yet, um, you're taking something that completely misrepresents the property. You know, you take a picture of the house, you know, every, every uh, man's house is his castle. So then you go up onto Serpentine and you take a picture of the castle, right? It's like, that's not your listing. Okay, so you have to take pictures of the subject property. Again, the view from the subject property or the amenities included in the HOA. So you take pictures of the community tennis court, the community pool. I probably wouldn't take pictures of people, you know, in the pool. Um, but you can you can do you can take pictures of the amenities offered by the homeowners association, the gate at the front of the community, whatever. Um, but clearly not the one next door. And if there's no ocean views from your house, then then, you know, again, right here, view from subject property. So, you know, if, if I've got to go down to the corner to get a view of the ocean, then I don't need to be taking a picture from there and representing that you, that's what you can see from the house. Does that make sense? Um, you know, for a lot of us, you know, it, it, it's intuitive. OK, I get that. Um, but I'm just surprised at how frequently I see that rule violated. Um, so and in some cases, people and or real estate signage. And again, that's rule 11.7. Uh, again, CAR has a form for that, the PVR form um, for when you include people. I don't know why you would do that. You know, babies, what, right? Um, pets, I probably wouldn't do that, okay? We have a listing right now where the agent took pictures and the dog, the, the, it was. he says it was impossible for us to take a picture because every time the we went to take the picture, the dogs would jump in front because I guess they knew they were getting the picture taken. So, uh can't use those. So we're not going to do that. You know, we're, and I'm not interested in going through the pain of having to do the PVR form with a seller. So, okay. That being said, um, use of a number, uh, another member's photos 
without permission. Again, it shouldn't say member, it should say subscriber. Um, but uh, you know, use somebody else's photos. You know, and folks, it happens all the time. Report it, do it right away. I would, you know, I don't know me. I, I always like calling the agent, saying, "Hey, you know, those are my pictures." Um, and and so, you know, assuming they don't hang up on me, which seems to be the prevailing thing to do. But uh, you hang up on me, I don't know. Maybe the MLS will call you. Who knows, right? But uh, you know, but hell, I'll sell you the pictures. I'll split it with you, right? If I if I paid a photographer, you know, five hundred bucks, would you pay two fifty? I mean, at least that way, you know, I recover part of my cost. Obviously, you probably didn't sell. Um, hopefully, you're not like. You you know, flipping it. Now you got another set of pictures. But, but uh, again, don't be using other people's pictures without their express written permission. Okay, good. All right, good. Misuse of the public remarks and the supplemental remarks. Very common. We've talked about a lot of those examples, you know, telephone numbers in the remarks. So public remarks and supplemental remarks are kind of the same thing. So let me see. Do I, ha I have my MLS? Uh, yeah, I do. I, so I have my MLS open here. Let me go in here and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to go in here to listing. I'm going to add a listing. I do this all the time. Our MLS is very understanding, <laughs> I tell you. So, you know, uh, again, quick course, the red button says close everything, right? And then I'm going to go down now to my remarks section. These are, by the way, these are called containers. Um, and then fields are going to be what you have inside of here, okay? So my remarks section, what can I do in there? I have a little question mark right here. Information is published on the internet, so we've got to be nice and we've got to be accurate, right, and thorough. IDX sites and or given to clients, right? So the client handout. You never want to hand out a full handout to a client or, or to, to someone you're working with, um, if they're not a subscriber, that's a violation. And I see it all the time in open houses. I see, you know, M, uh, the agents are spent the big bucks, right? They printed a copy of the listing, but they always print the copy of the one with their name on it and their phone number and all that. That's a full agent printout. It is not appropriate to have that. I take them out of, a, uh, you know, I, I see them in uh, um, flyer boxes outside of a house and I'm going to report it, okay? Because you know what? It's a violation and it contains information. They say, well, it's all about me. I want to make sure they know how to get a hold of me. Well, staple your card to a client handout if you're not going to spend the big money and have a flyer made. Okay, I get it. Even our own service here will do flyers for you, right? So, you know, just go to resource, go to uh, preferences or resources, I'm sorry, and, and you can print your own flyer, right? But, you know, anyway, the attributes of the, of the property, so the physical characteristics of the property or the neighborhood in this space. So the remarks section is the same, is, is the same as the supplemental remarks section. When I get down to supplemental, so my remarks section up here had uh, 1,600 characters. I rarely see people using all of it. I think that's a shame because your job is to sell the property. So, you know, 1,600 characters. Um, if you uh, if you need more room, you have to go to the supplemental remarks section to, to you know, you have another 4,000 characters there. Now, I kind of, I, I would argue that I think supplemental should be right underneath the regular remarks section because it's kind of like a a bleed over, although it doesn't automatically do that. If you run out of characters, then then this is just because this is an old way of doing, you know, the Black Knight, this is the program that we're using with them. But I think that uh, they should either give us more characters in the remarks section or, or have it automatically, when you run out of room, automatically go over to the supplemental remarks. At a, at a minimum, I think supplemental remarks should be immediately below the um, regular uh, remarks. But again, I see this frequently violated don't put in personal information, you know, no phone numbers, no, you know, open house on Sunday, two to four, that's going to be a violation. If you're going to do something like that, put it in the confidential remarks section, okay? Confidential remarks, um, uh, the, the, I talked to the agent this morning and, and uh, this afternoon, and, and they said uh, they've got uh, two dogs and a cat. And I said, um, I always, in my confidential remarks, if they've got an animal, you know, dog will bite. I mean, dogs bite and, and we don't have the ability to ask them why, but we know they hurt somebody. And so, you know, that's something we don't want to have happen. And frequently it's children. So, so, you know, I'm usually going to put some reference in there to animals. And this one, this uh, seller happens to also be a game warden. So there's lots of weapons and stuff. So, you know what, we need to be really careful about that. So confidential remarks, you know, if you're having problems with things or you want to put the gate code or the alarm code, do not put them in the regular remarks section, put them in the confidential remarks section. Directions of the property, 
please, folks, don't put in GPS. That we actually fired somebody. Uh, we just got tired of, of of those kinds of things. It's like you know, put in directions to the property because who's going to know better? Who's going to cast the 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 directions to the property in better light? Right? Um, you're not hiding things, but you you might not want to bring them past the junkyard. Um, okay, but but you know, but you know, you would know better than anybody the best way to bring them in. So I would put that in there. Uh, I, I think uh, GPS that I think is just rude. So um, advertising remarks. Let's talk about advertising remarks. I love advertising remarks. Um, my little question mark gives me this great big long list, twelve point five point one. So you know, unfortunately, it doesn't scroll very well. So I would tell you to go to rules and look up twelve point five point one. Look at all the stuff you can put in here. Um, it's intended to be included on third party websites. So when you input the stuff on the advertising remarks, you can put in almost anything, right? Obviously, you don't want to make a disparaging remark about another broker uh, or the real estate guy. I've seen people do it because this goes public. OK, so it's, it's like the remarks section, but the intent behind it was, you know, we had those uh, syndicators, third party aggregators selling um, a space next to our listing on their website um, and making it look like that person was the, the seller's agent when, in fact, it wasn't. So, you know, we allow you to do things like in here. You know, I just told this uh, young man this morning, you know, so please contact official sellers agent good spelling i figured i'd probably mess that up okay spell uh please there's not even an option look at that we got a great spell checker here so please contact official sellers agent in caps and i got that i can't remember the guy's name uh abbott uh down in downtown san diego he was putting this in all of his listings and i don't blame him he says i'm just getting tired of people selling spaces next to my listing and leading the public to believe that it's their listing when it's not who's going to know the property better than me OK, so here you can put in your name, you know, Kevy Baby, uh, my phone number, you know, that kind of thing. 509, 7500. I can put in my email address, you know, Kevin. So whoops, don't do that. So I can I can I cannot go crazy, but but I can probably do more than most people uh, know to do. And a lot of people don't even know that that uh, that feature is even available. I mean, and, and, and again, it's it's posted in the public view so that now uh, yeah, everybody. Oh, I hope I don't lose my uh, thing here. OK, nuts. Hopefully I didn't lose it. Okay, so um, so so now the public knows that you are the official seller's agent. So these uh, third-party syndicators, these aggregators, have an obligation uh, by contract to publish this near the listing. So, <clears throat> I mean, I want you to direct your traffic back to you. You you did the listing. You're the one that that did all the work on it. You deserve to get credit for it. Showing instructions required field. Um, don't leave it blank. Um, what else? There was other things in here I wanted to talk to you about as far as rules are concerned. Mandatory remarks, interestingly enough, and this gets violated all the time. Um, so when I click on mandatory remarks, it is a required field. Look at all these options. First right of refusal. None, if you don't know what that is, check with your broker. None known. There is no mandatory remarks. That's a possibility, right? Offer accepted contingent on court approval. So go through the list and see if any of these apply before you click on you know, the answer. If there is no answer, none of these apply, then the answer is none known. Is everybody OK with that? Um, but, but you know, we get people that try to, you know. And so, again, you know, whenever you see the magnifying glass, you know that there is a list. Whenever you see the question mark, then you know that there's an explanation. And so I always encourage you to look at the list. OK, um, another rule is that um, central lock is the lockbox for our area, for our MLS. If you use a lockbox other than the central lockbox, and I don't know why you would, but if you use a lockbox other than the central lock lockbox, then, then uh, you you must give, um, you must first of all tell everybody what it is, right? Um, but you must also uh, respond to calls within four hours. And that's an NAR rule, an NAR model MLS rule that you must respond within four hours. So, I mean, how many times do we see the coded box out in front of the house, which is just really bad? I mean, you know, you know what happens? The place gets vandalized. You don't know who it was, right? Because you don't have a record of who used the lockbox. So, uh, you know, we use central lock on everything. We've got, you know, we've got one day codes we can give to people after we've uh, verified that they're really real estate agents, you know, stuff like that. Everybody good with that? Um, variances, you know, 343, we kind of blocked that out for the moment. I don't know why. Um, but anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, let me take you back now. Uh, like I said, I'm going to get you out a couple minutes early. So misuse of the public remarks and supplemental remarks. Um, 
That includes contact information in the remarks, open house information, showing instructions. You know, uh, you put it in the regular remarks, seller only shows the property on Tuesdays at four. That's going to be a violation, okay? Um, reference to vacancy, that's going to be a violation, right? We don't want you putting in the MLS. Now, you do have a coded field, right? You have a coded field for uh, vacancy of the property, okay? So uh, um, where do we have, whoops, do we have it down here? Um, obviously occupied, it could be vacant, right? I can click on vacant, um, uh, in which case, obviously I won't have an occupant name or a phone number, right? But uh, the vacancy of the property becomes a real challenge for us because why? Because people end up, you know, vandalizing the property. Um, I've had real estate agents move into the property. Um, just trying to remember where the vacancy field is. Uh, oh, I don't remember, darn it. Um, general? Uh, anyway, it is a coded field. So uh, I'm not finding it at first blush and I'm not gonna spend any more time looking for it. So just is what it is. Um, so, uh, but, but don't refer to vacancy in the listing. So not in the remarks section, you know, confidential remarks, that's okay, right? But uh, if you refer to vacancy, you're just inviting opportunity for the bad guys to do stuff. It is a violation, it is a ticket. So it, it, even if it wasn't a ticket, I just don't think it makes good sense. OK, um, I've gone in and shown houses that were vacant, that uh, that people were obviously living in one of the bedrooms. So, um, you know, that I report that right away to the agent. Um, and and then, uh, you know, they probably didn't even know. Um, one of the DRE regulations is, is that you must make, you know, regular contact with the property, um, especially for issues like this. So, you know, they don't define what regular is maybe every five days, maybe every the week. But if you take a listing, you don't go there again for six months probably gonna have some challenges, um, including live open house information in the showing uh, instructions and in the unrelated fields. <clears throat> uh, and then number eight, misleading showing instructions. Again, remember what I said earlier about directions to the property, please be nice to everybody. You know, and, and again, cast the property in its best light. That's your job, you're a salesperson, right? So, uh, but misleading people about showing it. And part of times that becomes a violation where, where we say, you know, you got to call for an appointment. The property's really not available for showing. Um, I remember showing a property up on, uh, up on uh, San Alijo in uh, Encinitas. Uh, and I remember the guy, you know, the, 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 you know, we made an appointment, the whole thing. Um, we go into the property, myself and my business partner at the time, and the guy comes out of one of the rooms with a shotgun. So, you know, um, that, I don't think that property was available for showing. Um, needless to say, we had a conversation about the shotgun, but but uh, the property was not available. And so, you know, why are you telling me it's available? And then, of course, they they invited us in for the appointment. I think they were kind of buzzed on something at the time, but, you know, somebody's going to get hurt. So, you know, be accurate about your showing instructions and, and don't be deceptive. So sometimes agents knowing that you have to have make the property available for showing will just say, well, call the agent for an appointment and then and then they don't return calls or, or something like that. So it's going to it's going to be an 8.3 violation. OK, um, inaccurate residential style. So um, yeah, this happens, you know, a, a townhouse entered as a detached property. And so, again, um, you know, we always get into the situation about what is what is the attachment? So in the legal field, an attachment is, is, you know, has certain, you know, the seven methods of attachment. There are certain things that we look at to, to determine whether or not something is attached or not. And so, um, so a property, you know, and I, I know because we had these cases where, you know, the property was attached by a drain that ran from one roof to the other. So does that constitute an attachment? They're not connected in any other way, but the drain, I don't know. I still think that's an attachment, but uh, that's just me. Right. But uh, but again, you know, you could put in a variance request, whatever. But we frequently get this where the uh, you know, well, it's an end unit. So it really has a look and the feel of a detached property. You know, you had to mess with the input to do that. And so, you know, so again, I tell you that if you're not sure about something, you can always you know, reach out to me or you can always reach out to your MLS. Um, probably the better way to do it uh, is kind of like, you know, uh, asking the lender, you know, who the guy's going to give you money, you know, uh, uh, as to whether or not you can get the loan, you know, don't ask me, I don't know, I don't do loans, right? So, uh, so again, attached townhouses, um, I, I told you earlier, the case of the vacant land that, that, uh, that was listed as a house, the uninhabitable property, you know, that kind of thing. So um, do not put it into more than one property type at a time. <clears throat> uh, and 
The next question is whether or not with the changes in, in the economy and the things that we've got going on, can you put it in as a residential uh, and a re uh, residential home for sale and as a rental? I would say if you did something like that, you know, which one comes first, that's what we'll do. Make sure you have listing agreements on both. Make sure you have complete files on both. Um, and then when you input the listing, I would reference one to the other. Um, but, uh, but again, um, you know, we're, we don't like you crossing over the different uh, property types. OK. Um, all right. Um, clear cooperation. So, again, clear cooperation, national rule. We've adopted it. Um, violations are being reported due to members not including the coming soon status in their searches. So I want to show you that because this is really important. So let's take a look in here. I'm going to go back to my MLS. I'm going to uh, get rid of the listing. Uh, do you want to save it? No. Um, uh, so I'm going to go to my search button here. I'm going to look for residential. <clears throat> and and uh, while I'm searching here, notice in my fields down here under status, it says active and back on market. So this is what they're talking about. People are calling in reporting that they saw, you know, that it's not in the MLS. They saw a coming soon status on a sign, but it's not in the MLS. So look what happens when I hit my, my magnifying glass. There's my list. Notice my list only has active and back on the market. So this would be a, a good example of how somebody didn't see that because they didn't check the box, right? They should have checked coming soon and contingent in order to see those properties that are still actively for sale. So coming soon means only subscribers to our database can see it. Um, an active listing, everybody can see it, but coming soon, we're only sharing it among our database. That's it. Okay. Um, again, can't, you know, can't show it, can't do any of that. Don't call me for showing, right? Well, you can call me. I, I'm always happy to educate, but, but you can see how people were making the mistake thinking that the property was, uh, uh, you know, not in the MLS is coming soon, but it was because the box wasn't checked. That's all. Everybody understands Does that makes sense. Um, okay, so let me get us back to our stuff here. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, staff is finding most members are actually in compliance. And that's 7.6. It's okay. They don't mind the phone call. You know, we're all friendly. Okay. Um, but, you know, but, you know, if you're not finding it, we, we, we might, it might actually be there. You just didn't search for it. Right. That's all. And so again, in my, uh, my explanation, obviously check the box that says coming soon. Okay. So, so I want to thank you. I told you I was going to get you out of here a little bit early. Um, I want to thank you for joining us uh, for our discussion today. I, I, I always enjoy talking about the rules. I, I like to think I can make it more interesting than, than normal, but, uh, um, I always believe that because knowing is better than guessing. I, I just think that, you know, why would you take the chance? Why don't you ask somebody who knows? And okay, okay, so again, MLS is a great resource. They're good people, separate corporation, the whole thing. Um, they, they're they not there to, you know, yell at you or anything. They're there to help. Um, you can always get a hold of me. I'm always happy to help. Um, if, the, uh, if you if you want to look at any of our webinars, and so it'll take about an hour or so for this one to process, and then I'm going to load it up onto the uh, YouTube website. But um, you know, get your QR code reader ready. So here's the QR code. You know, your phone can read QR codes a lot of times. So uh, um, you can uh, take a shot of that. It'll take you to the to the actual uh, YouTube website. Um, you can also go to uh, you can just type into your browser at Burke Real Estate Consultants Inc. Um, and then that will uh, get you uh, straight to the YouTube website. Uh, we have a bit.ly link. So bit.ly forward slash real hyphen estate hyphen ed. Um, I've been approved by the Department of Real Estate to teach the RPA for five hours of continuing ed. Um, and so I'm really excited about getting the opportunity to do that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that SDR is going to have me do that. That doesn't make any sense to me, but OK. Um, but I had to create this website in order to put the information the Department of Real Estate requires me to put the information on, on uh, you know, make it available to people that want to just look to see what it is we're offering. So that that page has already been approved. So as I know more about when we're going to be teaching it, it will go up on this page. OK, um, please remember, if you go there, like and subscribe again, like just because it makes me feel better. I don't get paid anything for it. Um, uh, and, and if you have done this already, I thank you for doing that. Um, and then also subscribe. 
all subscribe does, you know, I don't have the ability to subscribe you, you know, you subscribe yourself. Um, but what that does is when I upload the newer version of something, it will notify you when you log into YouTube, it doesn't send you emails. When you log in, it'll tell you there's a newer version of something. Okay, that's all. So, you know, again, I redesign all of these before I bring them live because they change, the rules change constantly, right? Um, just like uh, we're going to be voting at pro professional standards uh, in a week and a half, uh, whether or not to include the RA form in all of your offers. Um, I frankly think it should be there. All your offers, all the listings, I think it should be there. Um, I've been talking about that for, uh, you know, since we came out a decade and a half ago with the form. Um, so little things like that, you know, I want you to make sure that you're current on stuff. And so I stay current so I can help you. That's all. So uh, if you have anything else you want us to talk about, education at sdar.com they're just running as fast as they can uh you can copy me you can send me the email copy them you can send me you know i had an attorney send an email into them that said you know let's have kevin teach a, a class on agency and i'm trying to think out <laughs> excuse me i do trial work on that i don't know how i'm going to keep it under an hour but i probably could you know given a little bit of work but agency is a, a complicated subject and a fascinating one for me um, and again, I handle it in several states. So, uh, so again, let us know whatever you want. Um, I do have a weekly email that goes out. Uh, it does do, uh, um, it, it contains the links to all my classes. So uh, you would have, uh, uh, you know, you have direct links so that, you know, you didn't, you know, we're, we're right now we have some transitional things going on at the association that are making it so that some of the classes I'm teaching are not being advertised on the website. I'm still doing the classes um, through the rest of the year. Um, so uh, if you if you're in, if you get the newsletter, you have a clickable link. You can click on it. It, it signs you up for the class. Um, also in that newsletter is going to be the, the link to get you to the webinars. So, uh, you know, I want you to be uh, complete. I want you to have everything. So uh, that being said, um, are there any questions for me? Anything uh, that I can help anybody with? Uh, I do thank you all for being here. This is going to round out the week for me. Um, uh, I do thank you. I appreciate your time. Uh, so thank you, everybody. If there aren't any other questions, uh, again, I do appreciate you and I wish you the very best. Have a super, super weekend. And uh, as we say from my hometown of Del Mar, I look forward to seeing you around the track.